Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with PBS 39 in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Today we are chatting with Victoria Coyle, CEO of Meals on Wheels of the Greater Lehigh Valley. Victoria has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. We'd thank you, Victoria, for joining us today. Thank you, thank you for having me. Meals on Wheels is so important, particularly to people who are isolated, people who are older, uh, people who are living with certain conditions in certain locations, certain income level. Talk about the real range of services and support that Meals on Wheels provides to its clients. I think that's a really great question because in large part, that's a very unseen aspect of what we do. Um, everyone knows this as delivering a hot meal every day to a client. But you're not just delivering takeout. No, no we're not. So our kitchen staff starts at three in the morning. They come in, they're freshly preparing those hot meals every day. So they cook it, uh, folks show up to serve it, put it on the line at six in the morning. Um, our volunteers show up around 10 o'clock in the morning. We have about um, 108 volunteers a day that go out on 84 different routes. So they pick the hot meals up in a, in a um, thermo cooler or heater rather that plugs into their um, cigarette lighter in their car and keeps it at 140 degrees during delivery time. And so the important piece is when the volunteer goes out, they're meeting with that client. Sometimes that's the only person the client sees in a day, in a week. So every day they're taking the meal out, they're connecting with that person. So I like to call it the social nutrition aspect of what we do. That's the huge part. So we can provide medically tailored meals to, to address people's health conditions, but then socially we're maintaining that connection that, that helps improve quality of life and uh, address social isolation. And that's another very important piece. There's a mental health component here. Uh, the physical health component is also afforded. You're actually running an assembly line, but you're running an assembly line with multiple branches mm -hmm. because the medically appropriate meals have to be very specific in terms of nutritional value and composition. Correct. So how does that actually function in terms of your, your supply chain and your purchasing? And how do you identify the medical requirements that each of your clients has? We have case managers who go out. So if, if a client, if a prospective client calls us today and says, or a family member, that's where a lot of referrals come from, says, I would like to start up on meals. The case manager goes out and assesses their condition. So they might find out, for example, that they have kidney issues. So we would then mark them down as needing a renal meal. Uh, all our meals across the board are, for, are appropriate for diabetics and for uh, people with chronic heart conditions. So right there, you've got those two major issues, health issues taken care of. Uh, we'll also puree or provide a soft meal for people who have dentition or swallowing issues. And finally, we do up to about 52 different personal preferences. So if you say to me, I don't eat carrots or zucchini, we won't give you carrots or zucchini. We're making a thousand meals a day, yet we're able to get down in the weeds that much with your personal preference. Because at the end of the day, we want you to eat the food. And if we give you a meal every day in which you have no choice, A, it affects your mental health, and B, you're not gonna eat half of it. And if you don't eat half of it, then we don't do our job by helping support your medical and social nutrition. And then you also have a supply chain of ingredients. Talk about how that functions. So our kitchen manager has a really hard job about trying to get the best ingredients at a good cost-effective price to keep costs down. I mean, we're not going to meet the, the costs that, um, you know, some big frozen meal provider can do. But again, those aren't medically tailored meals, and they're not delivered to you hot. Right. So the manager um, does a great job dealing with various local providers, um, some big ones. We also contract with uh, local farms because we have a Better Fresh project. And Better Fresh means we're giving you local in-season produce in your meal. It's a higher um, nutrient content than frozen or um, right. you know boiled down canned vegetables would have. Um, and then we um, uh, we also have a local meat supplier, a butcher, who will kind of tailor things to us. So if we say we need meatloaf, because sometimes we don't make those things, he makes it and he keeps it within the guidelines. So we comply with the senior dietitian, uh, dietary guidelines for the state. And um, we develop all our meals in conjunction with those guidelines. So he knows exactly how to keep the meatloaf low sodium, et cetera. And because of the way you operate, because of your need for trust and uh, being able to uh, assure that quality is exactly right. Uh, you are developing these relationships with uh, local businesses, local farmers, growers, butchers, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth, who supply this, and, and, and they become part of your constituency group and also part of your workflow. Correct, so uh, with produce, for example, 
we could tell you where the peaches came from, right. which section of the orchard this week these peaches were taken from. Um, so if there's a problem and someone says, I got a bad peach or something made me sick, we can really track down where it come it. from. Yeah, where it comes from. This is a standard that actually in many respects is higher than you see in, in supermarkets because while these batches are tracked, they frequently, when you get down into the weeds, they frequently get lost. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're creating handmade product every day and you are required to track because you have to protect your clients if there is an issue, you have to be able to respond to it contextually. Right, and we also, for quality control, we also freeze a daily meal. So we would have frozen at least two meals from today and we hold on to those for I think two months in our freezer. So if someone complains about something going wrong with, I got sick on whatever food you fed me on September 25th, we can pull that meal and have it tested. And, 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 and do the testing and, and determine whether there was an issue or whether this was just something else that right. really was not, uh, was not within your control. Correct. In terms of the training that you provide your people, uh, they come with certain skills, but they have to learn the way that, that it can actually function within this uh, very optimized workflows that result in a tailored product. How does that work when people come in and have to join your kitchen, for example? You know what's interesting about that is that our kitchen, we have very little turnover in our kitchen staff. We have a kitchen employee who has been there for 29 years. Actually, I correct myself, 30 years. She hit her 30th anniversary. She's back in the kitchen. Her job is to read the labels because, again, for the thousand meals that go out in a day, everybody is tailored specifically. So she has to make sure that what she is putting into the tray is what Mrs. Jones is supposed to get and then what Mr. Smith is supposed to get. I think there's a lot of pride in place that our employees have, and they feel very much um, a sense of family and community in the kitchen, and they see the connection between what they're doing and what goes on in the community and its effect on the client. Um, that I can't take any credit for. That, that has been built up. That's kind of Meals on Wheels pride that has been built up a number of years. But when you think about scooping food as a job that you want to do for 30 years, you might say, oh, heck no, not me. But when you're in that position and you're feeling the connection again to the client at the end of the, the line, I think that's really a lot of what keeps people motivated and keeps them staying in the job. And your drivers are not just van drivers, are they? They're not just, they're not just delivery people. What are they? Well, the van drivers technically are, but because it, then they transfer it to the volunteers. Right. So it's the volunteers who are going out. Um, so. But there's also this whole team, right? Yes, so yes. So you have the van drivers and then they, they're interacting with with, uh, with the volunteers, there, there is a interaction that goes beyond uh, simply delivery of a product. Yes, the van drivers, and again, I think this derives from the kitchen manager uh, or the food services director, he is very, very careful about the product that's going out. And, and I've learned a lot in the year and a half that I've been there. So I would, I would kind of casually say, well, you know, that's okay if they open up the, the hot bag and move things around. I mean, let the volunteers double check. And he, you know, kind of goes off the rails sometimes and says, no, that food leaves here at 140 degrees and it's going to stay at that temperature for four hours as long as people plug their bag in, they keep it closed. And that way, that's the safe temperature. And I know that when it gets to the client, that it's the safe temperature. And what happens after that happens after that. But before that, he takes a lot of pride and develops his regimen around quality control. So the van drivers take that message and when they're dropping off the meals to the volunteers at our certain drop sites, they're relaying that message, which is, for example, in the summertime, don't open the cold cooler. The more you open it, the more cold escapes, you know, et cetera, things like that. And they're very good about, um, again, that translating that quality control message. These are little details, and they might seem trivial, but, but actually whole industries were built around the concept of total quality management, mm. the whole idea of eliminating deviation, the whole idea of, of standards, the whole idea of, of constant improvement to workflows in order to uh, deliver a predictably high quality product. And that's essentially what you're talking right. about. I mean, it might seem simple, but this type of attention to detail at every step of the way and engaging everybody in their contribution from the person who scoops the food to the person who reads the labels to the person who prepares it to the person who delivers it and finally the volunteer who knocks on a door. Yeah, and I think what people don't see is that, um, that 
product creation and product development in the background. So I had said a couple months ago, let's roll out breakfast. We don't do breakfast now, but let's offer that as an a la carte item. Let's see if people want to buy it. We'll test it in a, in a small area. Um, let's talk about some things that can be made and frozen and reheated and taste good. Again, at the end of the day, we want to make sure people are eating the food. So I just think, okay, so let's throw some ideas out there. And Kitchen, you go make it happen. And, and the food services director says, you know, we have to look at how it reheats. So it's, I can make a breakfast bowl with eggs and chopped vegetables and chopped meat, but I have to make sure, I have to test it to make sure that when I put the label on, the reheating instructions are accurate and easy to read, and so people aren't heating it too long or too less. And if and it reheats and it doesn't taste exactly. good, you're not gonna do it, right? Right, so, and I- So there's a, more, there's a whole product development cycle right, here. Right, and I said, you know, how are we on that? And he said, oh, I didn't like the way the first ones, I didn't like the way the eggs uh, reheated, they were they were runny afterwards, so I need to try a different brand of egg to you know to make it work. And so I've learned a lot about that kind of thing. You know, you at home, you, even though I cook a lot, you don't think about about that stuff. But when you're dealing professionally, um, they're really it's a whole different ball game. So in terms of your budget, you have about three point five million dollar dollar budget. You have uh, forty five staff. How many uh, volunteers do you have? 2,000 active volunteers. 2,000 active volunteers. And you're serving? 2,000 individual clients. That is quite a proportion. It really is. It is a person-to-person -person business, isn't yep. it? Yep, it is. And, and in terms of, of ensuring that, that, uh, that as you are delivering these services, that you maintain financial balance, how, do you, how does your, um, your central staff function, how deep is it? Um, how uh, much uh, of, of this $3.5 million goes to supporting the overhead of the organization? About uh, two and close to two and a half million is food and kitchen related services. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it would be the case management staff, the administrative staff, the volunteer services staff, um, other front desk folks. Well, Victoria Coyle, thank you so much for sharing the work of Meals on Wheels in the greater Lehigh Valley. Congratulations on your merger. Thank you. And keep serving the public, us all, with those terrific meals and providing that amazing social cohesion that is so important, particularly to uh, people who are isolated, people who are older, people who really depend on you for for their own interactions. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting this issue. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for your insights. Thanks.